Good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Los Greek Kilo 8 Zulu Tango, and tonight's topic is fun with Morse. As usual, I have homework for you, and to get to the slides, you can use tiny.cc slash FWM, fun with Morse. It says 70 plus slides, but there's actually over 100 slides in this slideshow now. Don't worry, though, some of them are just quick pictures we'll pass through. This is my contact information, and I'll give that again at the end also. So Morse code, code, CW, they all refer to the same thing. And actually, there's multiple Morse codes. There's American, international, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to talk about the international Morse code that is used in amateur radio tonight, not the American code that is used on the railroads or for telegraphy. And we're also going to refer to it as CW, which stands for continuous wave. And that doesn't mean the signal's on constantly or continuously, it just is distinguished from dampened wave emissions from spark transmissions. CW replaced spark very early in amateur radio history. And uh, if you ever try to listen to spark and try and decode the Morse code in that versus our CW, you will be thankful for CW. The terms code, Morse, and CW will be used interchangeably during this talk. Before 1990, all amateur radio licensees in the United States were required to have at least some code proficiency for the license. It was dropped down to five words, event, five words a minute eventually for all classes, but there were still code requirements. 2007, code proficiency was eliminated from amateur radio uh, U.S. licensing. Before that, it was something you had to do. You had to get your code to get your license that you wanted. Many learned just enough uh, code to get their license, but never used it on the air. They really just wanted the voice privileges. Or worse, they got frustrated and lost interest in amateur radio altogether and dropped out. So fun with code? Well, maybe. So the goal of this presentation is to help you get on the air using code to learn how it can be a fun and effective way to make contacts on HF and VHF, UHF, to get you on the air as soon as possible. There's no testing, shaming, or any judgment of your code ability, the idea is to get you on the air. It's fun because you choose to do it. It's not required for your license. It's more efficient in getting contacts in single sideband, especially with QRP, low power, or poor antennas. CW is also an extremely popular contesting mode, with many contesters preferring CW and not taking part in some of the single sideband contests. Single sideband QSOs are probably the most difficult uh, HF contacts uh, because it requires a better signal to noise ratio than CW or the two really stars, FT8 and FT4, JT65, which have a great ability. If you're interested in those, I have a whole presentation on that at tiny.cc slash FT8, FT4. Whenever you see this symbol or this font, that means there's material that you can click on for additional information. Another reason why you might consider Morse code fun, lower cost of equipment, simple kits. And one of the things I hear a lot of times from young operators is no one knows how old you are. You're not a youngster uh, with a crackling voice that gets boys get mistaken for girls and vice versa on uh, phone. No one's going to know how old you are or what your voice sounds like. Um, and my wife loves it because she doesn't hear it when I'm sending it because I always wear headphones. But even when I'm wearing headphones and operating single sideband, she hears me shouting into the microphone. Uh, other than the slight side tone, which she can't perceive from a distance, she loves when I'm doing a CW contest as opposed to a phone contest. And even if you have a technical if you have a technician license, do you realize you already have HF privileges besides 10 meters with a tech license? Techs have CW like uh privileges on 80, 40, and 15 meters, in addition to 10 meters where they have CW data and voice. And speaking of 10 meters, if you weren't here, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, I guess it was, I did a presentation on 10 meters that you can find in the Rat Pack video archives. If you're interested in more information on technicians and privileges for technicians, I have a whole presentation, uh, Technicians Life Beyond Local Repeaters. So tonight we're going to talk about learning the code, using code, some tools you can use uh, for a variety of things with code, and some tips and tricks. 
We're not going to teach you the code tonight. That's by no means the goal of tonight's session, but we're going to talk about uh, how you can learn if you're new, and if you aren't new, how you can use it and become more effective with what you have. These are some general guides to CW, and all these are links with a lot more information. Some of them are long books and th and uh, essays on Morse code and operating Morse code. Now, learning the code, one of the things that's very important is don't get frustrated because everyone learns at a different pace. And some people, it's very easy for them to learn code very quick. Other people have to struggle a little, a little bit to get there. And some people are just naturals. They just pick it up immediately and run with it. But there are three ideas that I can get you started on the right foot. No matter how you choose to go on from this point, I suggest three, three, three things. Do not learn to count d dots, or what we actually refer to as dits, or dashes, which we refer to as DAWs. It will just slow you down because your brain, if it's counting and then having to use a lookup table in your brain to figure out what it is, so you want to hear it as a complete sound. You want to hear each letter as a unique sound made up of short and long tones. I suggest you learn at a minimum of 10 words per minute, maybe even a little bit faster than that. This helps you not try and count the character elements. Uh, the Fonsworth method is a method where you speed up the speed of the characters, but you put more space in between each character to give you a little bit more processing time for your brain to work, and that's very popular also. So in the Farnsworth method, individual characters are set at the target speed, which is the characters per minute speed, but an extra space is set between the char extra spaces left between the characters to slow down the effective word per minute rate. So these are just two abbreviations you might see when people are talking about code. CPM means characters per minute, WPM means word per minute, and it's calculated by using a standard phrase uh, of a set of care of words uh, that they calculate would, would be could be sent in one minute. There are a number of different ways you can learn the code. You can use software for your computer, apps for your phone. You can have on-air classes. You can use code training devices. And in the olden days, a lot of people used recordings. Originally, they were on LPs. And then they were on cassette tapes, and then they were on uh, DVDs. I never saw an 8-track ta uh, code tape, but there probably was 8-track tapes out there also. The problem with any type of recording is your brain very quickly uh, memorizes the small amount of material that fit on that recording. And you're, what you're doing then is you're just testing your memory as opposed to your code skills. It's important to have a plan. Whether you're going to use software or apps, you need to set a goal and time per practicing per day. Uh, set long-term goals and rewards. Additional things and frequencies you can do with your new skills, new equipment you want to purchase, on the air activities you might want to take part in. I know a lot of people get involved with Morse code because they want to operate POTA and they want to increase their, op their options by also operating CW. I strongly suggest that when you're learning code, you have a buddy. Now, this buddy can be in the form of a class full of people. It might just be one other person. Or what's became very popular during the pandemic and has really grown is online groups of code learning and practicing. And there's two main groups I'm going to talk about, and both of them do an excellent job. One is called the Long Island CW Club, and it has classes, over 75 classes a week, different times, different days. So it's very good if you need a flexible schedule. Not all their classes are just learning CW, though. They also have classes on using it on the air. They also have classes on equipment, uh, technical subjects. And I even teach a class called The Joy of Operating on Tuesday nights that has no training of Morse code in it. It just talks about all the other things like logging software, QSLing, et cetera, et cetera. Check out the, the Long Island CW Club at this link. Um, you have to join the club. It's not that expensive to join the club. Once you join the club, you can either do it yearly or you can get a lifetime membership. And that gives you full access to all the club activities. If you're under 18, though, it is free to take part in special what they call kids classes. If you're interested in some more information, you can also listen to the Rat Pack recording. We did an interview with Howard W2, uh, W, I'm going to forget Howard's call now. I'm not going to try it because I'm going to forget it. 
uh, you can listen to Howard's interview that we did for the Rat Pack uh, about a year and a half ago. And so you can go to that link. Another group is the CW Ops. They have something called the CW Academy. And they it's a class uh, that takes place in three quarterly sessions. So they have classes in January and February, April, May, and September and October. When you sign up, you're, you're assigned to a specific cohort. And that cohort meets once or twice a week on a regular basis, plus practice time and other uh, time. And you get together via Zoom, just like the Long Island CW group. So check out the CW Academy by clicking on this link. If you want more information, Eric Silverthorne uh, from the group did a presentation for QSO today uh, in 2020. And this you can click on this link to get the video uh, presentation on that. There's some software out there, G4FON, LCWO, CW Studios. Uh, the program that uh, the Long Island Morris, uh, the Long Island CW Club uses is called Morris Practice Page, and it's very similar to the uh, CW Ops Morris Code Trainer. So both of these are very similar. There's slight differences. Both of these, when you click on them, they are web-based. So you, oh, the link didn't work. Let me try that one more time. Oh, I got to fix the link. I will fix the link on that. Let's use the other one. Uh, they are web-based training tools, so you can go out on the web and actually use them. You don't need to install anything on your computer, and they can let you set all the parameters you need for learning CW. And I will fix the link on this other one. There's also J, J, M, J Morris, CW Player, Morris DX, uh, Ninja, Just Learn Morris Code. These are all online uh, software that you can use to learn the code. There's also apps for phones. These are Google uh, Android apps, uh, but there's very similar apps for iPhone, uh, for iOS also. Most of these are free. Some of them do have a small charge for the apps. I think the highest costing is $3 or something like that, but they're something you can have on your phone. There's also hardware devices for learning code. You might think that you recognize this device as a Morse code decoder from MFJ, but this is actually the 418 Code Tutor, and it is a Morse code tutoring device that will give you endless random generated code for you to practice with. Uh, K1EL has the Morse code tutor kit, which actually serves three purposes. Not only is it a Morse code tutor kit, but it is also a memory keyer, and it is also a set of paddles if you want to connect a set of paddles to this and use it. So even after you learn Morse code, you can use, continue to use this as a kit. And here's information on that and links for each of these different devices. There's also some other ones out there. There's a kit from KB5CQ called the Morse Code Trainer Kit. It uses a, an Arduino uh, type of technology or microprocessor type. Uh, and then another one, the motors from W8TEE. That's Jack Purdom, who's of the T41 fame. He also has a kit, a Morse Code Tutor Kit using a microprocessor. One of the popular things, and we had a presentation on this for uh, Rat Pack also, called the Morisino, Morris Reno 32. It's a multifunctional open source device that has built-in paddles, or you can plug in a set of paddles or a stray key, and it can uh, generate practice Morse code. You can send to it, and it can evaluate the code you send, but you can also connect via short distance radio using the little antenna to two Morris Renos, and you can send back and forth just like you're on the air, or you can use this to connect the Wi-Fi and go to a server on the internet where you can also practice live with other people without having to be licensed or worry about propagation. Again, there's a video from Rat Pack that was done uh, last year, and you can watch that Rat Pack video. Now, something fun, if you like to play Wordle, and I know some people out there do, there's also something called Morsel. And Morsel is similar. Um, I need to stop my sharing and restart it so you can hear the background sound. So let me do that real quick. And let me turn up the volume a little bit. So what you do is you play Morse code, and I've already solved it for today, unfortunately, so I can't do it. But what it does is it plays the Morse code, and you get to uh, do that. It'll also do practice words. So it, after 
three try it so it eventually it does each each of three uh the same speed and then it slows down slows down so you get multiple tries to do it and you can guess what the letters are once you start getting the basics down you might want to start thinking about copying completely in your head and there's a program there's a a process called wordsworth uh, the George Ellison K1IG talks about in his QSO Today Expo presentation. Again, you can click on this link for the video. So that's a little bit about learning Morse code. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the basics of using Morse code. First of all, sending Morse code quite often is basically comes down to very simply turning on or off a switch that connects directly to a radio. So a straight key is nothing more than a spring-loaded switch that when you push down on it makes contact. When you release it, on the, the uh, contacts disengage. So you're basically making and breaking a circuit. And that's called a straight key. There's also something called a bug, which is a semi-automatic mechanical key, or the key is it's mechanical. But then there's also electrical type of keyers that use either double lever paddles uh, sometimes mistakenly referred to as iambic paddles. They're not really iambic paddles, but you can use them for iambic sending. And I'll talk a little bit more about the distinction in a minute. There's also what's called a single leveler paddle, which is also sometimes referred to as a side swiper, the, just one paddle that goes back and forth to either side. So here's an example of a stray key. Here's an example of a mechanical bug. Here's another example of a stray key. And here's a really good pr uh, presentation by Rich, AG6QR, that talks about bug terminology, iambic, and all those things I talked about earlier. He goes into great de detail about all different types of Morris code sending devices. And you can go to that link, and hopefully it won't take this long for you to load. Okay, well, it's not getting there, so let's figure that out. Here's examples of some straight keys. Uh, the one up here, letter F, is what's called a flame-proof key that would be used in an environment where there might be a potential for uh, gases. Navy keys were quite often these flame-proof keys. Um, here's a, a key that's often referred to as a J38 uh, or J38 clone. They were very popular. But so there's a number of different keys here. This is a particular key that I have. This is a Czechoslovakian army key. Here's some examples of uh, mechanical bugs or uh, semi-automatic mechanical keyers. It's so quite often you'll hear Vibroplex is one of the names, but there are other brands of these. I am not capable or useful at all with a bug. I am not a bug person. I, I stick to paddles and straight keys myself. Now, if you're using a set of paddles like any of these, you then need an electronic keyer. In this case, this particular set has the keyer built right onto it. So it's this paddle with a set of, uh, with an electronic keyer that piggybacks on the back of it. You can also have separate um, electronic keyers. Uh, sometimes you might use the one in your radio, but you can use all these external ones. Most electronic keyers have programmable memories. Most recent HF radios have built-in keyers but sometimes they don't have nearly as many features as the externals. These iambic keyers or paddles can be set to autocomplete letters. There's a couple different varieties. There's squeeze keying, uh, there's iambic keying, and again, these talk about debunking these myths about what each of these are. Some keyers have, some electronic keyers have features and a port to use a PC keyboard. So I have a keyboard plugged into my keyer also, so if I pick up my keyboard, I can also send my call sign by just hitting one key on my keyer and it will gladly send. I don't think I have my side tone turned up. Oh, I don't have my side turn turned up. So I'm not going to hear that. Um, a few radios even have the ability to put a directly attach a keyboard to send CW or RIDI. And I'll show you a couple of those in a minute here. The other way you can send CW is from a computer program such as a contesting or logging software. Um, they use, use either a serial interface, a parallel interface, which is pretty much discontinued and gone now, or they can send commands to the radio's internal keyer. Uh, you can also use a device called a wind keyer. This, the, the advantage of using a wind keyer as opposed to a serial interface 
is it removes all the keying responsibility from Windows and the timing that's associated with it and puts it into a hardware device. I'm going to skip over this right now, but I'm going to just talk about a few things in here. This is an example of a simple circuit that you could use to use a serial port or a serial USB adapter to key your radio. Uh, it uses an opto isolator so that you're not getting voltages traveling between the two. You can also do it with transistors and diodes. Here's some other circuits to do that with. Um, here's some of the keying software uh, that you can use to, key, to electronically key your radio. And actually, I am going to go through some of this. I thought I, I was mistaken on what this was. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with Windows, you can sometimes run into problems. So a lot of people go with the wind keyer in addition uh, to using their uh, software to send it, and it sends the commands to the wind keyer, which then keys the radio. Now, some radios support proprietary commands to key the radio CW via CAT control, computer control. So I have an Elecraft K3 here, and I, instead of sending the, the CW to open and close the keying jack, I could actually send CAT controls to it to make it key that way. And I also do the same thing for RIDI. When I'm using RIDI, I actually send the CAT controls directly to the radio instead of uh, feeding the audio into the radio. Here's uh, some examples of the wind keyer. There's different varieties of it. You can buy just the uh, chip and build your own device, or you can buy the wind keyer assembled keyer or the little uh, compact keyer, which just has USB ports on one side and uh, one point uh, um, three point five millimeter jacks on the other side to plug in to plug your paddle in or to plug in to your radio for the keying. Uh, here's a little serial kit. Another device that you can buy is the Mo Ridi, and uh, it's a little CW and Ridi keying device uh, that's the size of about two quarters in length, and uh, you can configure it with different software. You can either load K3NG's CW software on it. Uh, to Anthony uh, K3NG, Anthony Good, has a project that's been copied many times for his CW keying software using microprocessors. So those are some of the ways you can send. Now we need to talk about receiving a little bit. And I want to talk about the contest paradox. A lot of people, when they start with Morse code, are very intimidated by receiving on the air. You know, they're afraid they're going to miss a character. They're forget, afraid they're not going to be able to send a character right. Um, they're going to get lost in the conversation. So even though contest contacts are at much higher speeds, they're actually one of the easiest places to practice when you're first get, learning CW. Because to make a CW contact, you only need to copy one item. That's their call sign. And they're going to send it a couple hundred times an hour, a couple thousand times an hour, so you get plenty of tries at it. And you're not worried about the contest, so you're not going to worry about the exchange they're going to send you. You're just worried about making sure that you know their call sign. So once you figure it out, you're ready to reply to them. You can also look it up on DX spotting sites and get an idea of what the call sign is. It might not be right, so make sure you copy it first before you are sure. Don't count on the DX spotting site to be right. You also need to know what your own call sign sounds like. And hopefully you'll learn that very quickly. You need to learn what your call sign sounds like very fast so that when you drop your call sign in and they respond to you, you'll know that they're answering you. There are a couple other things you need to know, but they're not very difficult. You need to know when they want you to send your exchange. So you're gonna, what's going to happen is they're going to send their call. You're going to drop in your call. They're going to answer your call and send an exchange to you. But we don't care about the exchange because we're not interested in the contest. We just need to know when they're done with the exchange. So we need to wait until they stop. And then we need to send them the exchange that they need. Hopefully, they'll get it correctly, and they'll send either an R, an RR, a QSL, a TU, a 73, or something like that to let you know that they've gotten it. If they did not get it, they might send a question mark or an again. So you know, need to know what a few of these little characters sound like at very high speeds, but you'll get used to these pretty quickly. If you're using a memory key or keyboard or CW, 
contesting software, you don't even have to worry about what's involved in closing the key or squeezing the paddles. You can simply hit one button and send that information. So again, you're not going to get nervous doing that, sending your call sign because you already have it programmed in. I did a whole interview with ditdit.fm on CW Contesting that talks about this whole idea of getting started by jumping into contest uh, where you only need to worry about a call sign and a few other characters. There's also some contests that have slow speed operation. So these are the best of both worlds. It's a contest where you're just gonna have to copy the call sign and send uh, your call sign in exchange, but it's also at a slower speed. So the K1 USN weekly slow speed net called the SST takes place on Saturdays and Sundays. And uh, they have a speed limit of 20 words per minute, but most people send about 12 to 13 words a minute. And you can find more information on that by going to this link. There's also a medium speed contest sponsored by the, uh, the Long Island CW group, uh, and that's available on Mondays. So you can find that information on your favorite contesting calendar. Now, what if you can't copy really well? Well, you can try and use soft, uh, software or hardware decoding. It isn't going to be perfect. I'm going to tell you that now, especially if the other person is hand sending their CW. If conditions aren't great, you're going to have some problems with these, but they can be very helpful. Uh, so there's computer software, hardware decoders, decoders that are built into radios, and phone and tablet apps that you can use to decode Morse code. As I said, they're not perfect. They work best with strong signals in the clear, with perfectly sent CW. Machine set CW, which is the best that it's able with, and that's when it's someone sending it from a keyboard or a software program. Ironically, they're usually much better with faster Morse code, under 10 words a minute, and they tend to fail badly. When the speed goes up, they tend to be much better at decoding. Also, when there's very little Q or no QRM or QRN, and when your radio has effective narrow filtering or and or DSP to get rid of other artifacts. And surprisingly, these are all pretty much the same with the exception of the speed thing uh, when you're trying to copy code in your head. Having a clear, perfectly sent CW is always advantageous no matter how you're trying to copy it. These are some of the code software decoding tools out there. Some of these are free. Some of them have a fee. CW Skimmer takes a big chunk of the band and gives you multiple decodes at one time. Um, FL Digi will let you tune in a band map very similar to what you would do with uh, PSK or FT8, and uh, you can do it that way. There's also MRP40, which is, does a pretty good job. This is a paid program also. FL Digi is free. Uh, some of these have free versions or demo versions. Some are paid. Uh, one is built into Ham Radio Deluxe. Uh, I've never really used that particular one, so I don't know that much about it, but these are all decoding software. The N1MMM contesting law software does not do decoding on its own, but it does support interfacing with FL Digi or CW Git or an external hardware device that is capable of sending of decoding CW. There's also other hardware devices such as the MFJ461. Now again, this looks like the tutor, but it is not the tutor. This one, you put the little microphone right here next near the output of your radio and it hears the sound and it tries to decode it and also tries to guess it what the words per minute is. You can also hook this up directly using an audio cable for better results than trying to use the microphone. Here's something very similar, but this particular one has a built-in keyer. This keyer can plug in a paddle, a stray key, or you can plug a keyboard into this and send your CW by pressing the keyboard while you're reading it on the decoder. Uh, the same people that make the wind key also have something similar, the CW keyer reader, uh, the K44. They also have the K42 earlier. Again, it will read CW and it will also act as a CW keyboard generating tool or a keyer for your stray key or your paddles. There's one that I've seen on eBay a couple times, the digital modem. This is does CW, but it also does PSK and RIDI. 
It's designed for the Yesus that have the interface that's the same, the 817, the 857, the 891, the 991 can all use this particular device that connects via the data port on the radio, and it's a self-contained uh, device to do decoding, uh, and uh, you can do multiple modes with it. Now, you might have seen these under $12 or under $10 uh, decoders on eBay. These are probably the least accurate of all the decoders I've talked about, but they will give you some information. Some radios have built-in Morse code dec decoders. The Elecraft radios, the K3, the K3S, the KX3, the KX2, all have built-in seven-character decoders that will show up right where the secondary frequency is. And here's an example of uh, what you see on the screen here. This is what it looks like as it's decoding it. I actually built a little interface device that's used in Arduino that hooks up to any of the L-Crafts. It's called the Second Look. And let me just play this little video quickly here. You can see it's decoding up here, but then it's sending the information down to this 80-character display. doesn't do the decoding itself. It's simply taking the decoding from the radio and using the serial port of the radio to show it on a wider screen. The Elecraft, I'm sorry, the Kenwood TS590SG, not the S, just the SG model, the later model, also has a code decoder in it. And I have one of these radios that I use it a lot in schools because the nice thing is there's a piece of software that you can get for free from Kenwood that takes that small display from the radio and lets you display it on your computer. And by doing that, I can put this up on the screen so the students can see what's going on. I send my call repeatedly so they get used to it. And then I'll call a station and I'll ask them to listen to see if they can hear that KZT coming back. And of course, they pick that out pretty quickly, but then they can see the rest of the conversation. So if you do have a Kenwood TS590SG, you can get this free software and download it. Uh, the L the Yesu FT uh, DX3000, the DX1200, and now the FT DX10, I don't know about the 710 because I've not seen a 710, has some decoding in it. Again, not quite as good as what the Elecraft does, but it still works. And the, the Tentec Jupiter was one of the first radios I know that had a built-in decoder in the second version of their firmware, and it shows up right down here. One of the neat things about this radio is it's it's a used radio. You can't buy it new anymore. But on the back of it, it has a jack to plug in a standard IBM keyboard, and you can actually send CW just by typing on the keyboard. So on the back of this, there's a jack that has a, key, a keyboard uh, keyboard jack on the back of this. If you have an older Tentec Jupiter with the older firmware, you can still download the firmware. It's still out there and upgrade your radio to have the decode capability. Uh, the Zygu G90 has a rudimentary decoding system on it. Uh, so does the Zygu X5105, and I think the 61 does also. Now, the QRP Labs has one of the best decoders in it, and it's also one of the cheapest. Uh, the kit was $49. It's now $55 for the newer version. It's a single-band CW transceiver. Uh, so you pick the band you want, you build the kit, or you can buy it pre-assembled for a little bit more money. And you can see right here, uh, it decoding it right on the screen here. It's a 5-watt radio. Now, they've came out with a newer version, the QCX Plus. Again, it's a little bit better radio. It's a, just a little bit more money, $55, $145 built. Uh, the case is additional cost. Or you can buy the miniature version of it, which uses a lot more surface mount parts in it, but it is still a kit and you can assemble the rest of it. Most of the surface mount parts are already assembled, not all of them. And again, the case is extra, but it'll fit in the palm of your hand. And I actually have one right here. This is one for 20 meters. They all look exactly the same. This is one in the case, but they are fun little radios. They don't draw much power and they, have a high performance CW transceiver built into them.
Here's a close-up of the QCX Plus showing you how the board's mounted. The Mini. And here's what the Mini looks like inside. Now, this has nothing to do with CW, but just to mention, if you've ever heard of the micro SDX, it basically takes the circuitry on this QCX, takes some of the components off, some adds some other components, and actually builds it into a single sideband radio. So the micro SDX is actually an outgrowth product project modifying QCXs to operate on single sideband. Um, this is the PrepCom code reader. It's a building code reader, but the thing they really emphasize is a, there's a radio in there, but they really emphasize the code reading part of it. And the whole idea is this is designed to be very simple to use, all self-contained. Uh, the 40 meter radio is 349, although they have it on sale sometimes for less, a lot less than that. You can also buy a tri-band version for 499, which is also on sale sometimes, or you can buy what's called their zero band version. This doesn't have a radio in it. It's just a decoder, and you plug it into any radio, and you put the audio in, the key keypad out, and things of that nature, and you can use this. It's a touchscreen uh, controlled device for all the settings and all the uh, everything you do with it. It uses the keyboard up and down arrows to tune the radio. Um, if you're interested, you can go to PrepCom and view. They have a number of nice videos there on the site. There's also some apps available for phones. Again, this is Android. There's also some similar apps available for iOS. This is the, um, the skimmer software that I talked about earlier. There's also an Android version of it out uh, that you can play around with by the same uh, gentleman, Alex VE3NEA. By the way, the CW skimmer software is what's used in the reverse beacon network. It gathers up all that information and feeds it to the reverse beacon network. So it does work, and, you, and proof is the way it works on the reverse beacon network. Now, using a code reader successfully, it always helps if you're able to also copy the code in your head. So by doing two things, it makes it even easier. Listen to multiple QSOs before sending to get the station's information correct. Use the radio's narrow filters. Use DSP and other noise limiting settings. Use context clues, whether you're using a decoder or whether you're just copying in your head, you're allowed to use context clues. My wife was a reading teacher for years, and she'd have kids that couldn't figure out a word, and she'd say, well, what word fits in this sentence? And as soon as she'd say that, that context clue, they'd figure out the word. The same thing is true on most CW conversations. You're going to know a lot of the words that are going on, and if you miss a couple letters, you can figure it out quite often. So unless it's a serial number or a call sign, you might be able to figure out that when they sent the five letters of the word and you missed the sixth letter, what that missing letter is very easily. Also, know what a typical QSO or contest exchange sounds like so you know what you're going to expect. No CW operating jargon. No Q codes and abbreviations because those things are not the same as the words. So you need to know some of those. And I have a link to that on one of my uh, um, information sheets. Here they are. Here's the links right here for uh, abbreviation code signs and for Q symbols. You can click on these links, go out and see the information. Here's one simple one from the ARRL. Here's another one that has a lot more information. Uh, there's so many Q codes on here that you'll never use. Find out the ones you use so you don't learn all the ones we don't use. Like, does anyone know what QTM means? QTM is what is your magnetic heading? Something you don't hear on an everyday conversation, but things like QTH. QSR means please slow down, uh, QRN, QRM, QRL means is the frequency busy, et cetera. So knowing basic Q symbols can very help. There's also shortcut words that are used quite a bit. Uh, there's always the temptation by CW operators to make everything shorter. So instead of sending the word end, they send the abbreviation for an ampersand, which is ES. So it's dit, 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 dit. So you'll hear that instead of and quite often. Also, if you make an error, you send eight dits. I don't have any, let me tune up my side tone here. And sometimes it won't be a full eight, but you know real quick, once you get past five, it's not a letter number five. There's also something called cut numbers. 
Uh, typically, when they're sending 599 in a CW contest, they won't send 599. They'll send 5NN because the N is da dit. The 9 is da 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 dit. So it takes a lot longer to do it. T for zero, da instead of da 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 da. A for one, da da instead of dit 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 da. Also, the context clues will help you if there's drop dits. Uh, run together characters, etc. Now I'm going to skip over some of these right here. Just this is five nine nine. I have a lot of information on cut numbers, which I'm going to skip through here. If you are doing that thing about making contests in a contest or making contests anytime, the question is often that they copy me. How do I know they got they understood my CW and got it? So by knowing what you would get if the, they don't get you a question mark, a call with a question mark, and again, a repeat, and I have this for phone also, but the CW ones are the ones in capitals. If they do copy you, things like TU, Roger, 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 QSL, 73, OK, are things that you would get. Now, some letters are busted more often. And when we say busted, that means someone gets it wrong. And they put together these statistics by analyzing the CQ, the AWRL DXCW 2020 logs. And uh, the most busted letter is the letter H. It's most often mistaken as an S. They'll miss the fact that it has four dits instead of three. B, the number one most busted number in call signs is unfortunately the number eight. And uh, the least frequently busted number is the number one. So this is just a little chart showing you that some characters are busted more often than others. And if you're really serious about contesting, you, you may not want a call sign that has a three H's in it. Uh, this is a little a graphic showing you also, again, which letters are most commonly busted and what they're most commonly busted by. This tells you that the, doesn't matter if you're doing code, if you're doing phone, the same char characters are not the same characters, but other characters are still busted. And now you'll see that eight is the number one most busted character on phone. And here's the little chart for that. So use a DX plotting cluster, get an idea of potential call signs, operating contest, use the N1M history files for help with copying the exchange if you're interested in the exchange. But don't count on it being exactly right. You need to still listen and figure out what they're sending. Uh, using FL Digit in a contest, there's a YouTube video from K0PIR. Uh, there's also the help doc for setting up N1MM to interface with FL Digi. Another YouTube from M0JCQ and a presentation from KS3K. So you can use FL Digi and operate in a contest. You will be assisted in most cases. If you are using FL Digi to operate CW, I don't. I suggest that you do not use the default method of feeding the CW into the radio. What they do is they actually generate it as an audio tone and feed it in via the mic. I suggest instead you use the setup where it actually keys the radio the same as if you're using a stray key. And there's some hardware interfaces that do that, or you can, if you have a wind keyer, you can do it also. And I think that's a better way to go because that means you can use the CW mode on your radio and take advantage of the CW filtering as opposed to operating on single sideband where it's very wide and hard to copy. And here's the information on doing that, but I'm not going to go through right now. If you're interested in uh, making contacts, these are all some quick guides to making your first CW contact and operating on CW. Again, you can click on any of these links. These are programs that are actually simulators of contest activity. So Ruffs, uh, Simple Morris, Pop-Up Runner, CW Simulator, Morris Runner are all programs that you can run to simulate a contest and you try and copy the call signs with added QRM and follow-ups and everything that you would have in an actual contest. Again, these are the links for more information on getting started with CW. If you get started and you're really interested in, consider joining one of these four different clubs that are very active in CW. And for fun, you can build a, your own Morris code and sounder by using a clothespin, 
a computer buzzer, a nine volt battery, and a few pieces of wire. And I have the instructions for building this. This is a great project when you're working with kids. And uh, in the instructions here, I also have a quick, I don't have it here. I have another link that has a quick decoding chart for, you're not gonna learn CW that way, but it allows them to send their names and things back and forth to each other. I'll add that to the end of this. I thought it was in here, but it's not. My website also has a page full of uh, CW information. And this is the get, again, the link to the slideshow, tiny.cc slash FWM fun with Morris. My contact information and also a link to all my slideshow presentations at tiny.cc slash K-A-Z-T dash P. So I will go ahead now and stop my slide, my sharing, and I'll go ahead and take questions. First of all, let's see if we have anything in chat here. Yeah, it'd be helpful if I uh, unmuted myself. Barry, what we got going in the chat? Nothing, no questions anyway in chat. Oh, there is one statement that I didn't mention. The AWRO also has on-air code practice at different speeds. Uh, and Barry put a link in there for that, and someone else put a link in there. So you can use the AWRO. Uh, and what they do is they send text from the magazine. So like they'll send QST text or QEX or National Contest Journal text. Um, if you run across them on the band and you can copy CW at all, you'll quickly realize that it's code practice because they're sending words that normal CW operators never bother to include, like the, uh, you know, they put it, they're putting in a bunch of extra things. See, one of the things that most CW operators do is they tend to be very Spartan in their text so that they're not sending extra characters or extra words. Okay. Uh, questions, please feel free to raise your hand or type something in chat and Dan will acknowledge you. You can unmute and uh, let me know what your questions are. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions on anything. Well, I'll jump in there real quick. Yes. When I was learning code, I was a youngster. And one of the things that I discovered uh, while we're going down the road, I was always a passenger as a teenager, of course, but as the signs come up, you're going to freeway. There's all these million signs. I pick a sign and I try to decode it in my head or encode it, uh, CWY, you know, and before it passes, and it's depending upon what speed you're going, it helps you speed up yourself a little bit. So that, that was one little trick I did. And the other one is folks just get on there and use it. Go go to the there's always slow guys on there, there's always faster guys on there. But if you just use it, it comes much, much faster. Yes. And you can ask people to slow down if you have to. Yes. If you send QSR, that means please slow down. And almost everyone will do that. And I see we have one Long Island uh, CW Club member there, Ringo. He has his uh, logo up there. Other questions? Yeah, Long Island CW Club. I joined it back in January. And I got on the air last weekend for a POTA activation, and I couldn't have done it without it. But it's just getting out there. People are nice, QRS, question marks. And now I'm more addicted than I was two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said I said QSR instead of QRS. Um, it's, it's a question in the chat, is CW used a lot with QRP? Yes, it is. Uh, there's a lot of QRP operators that only operate CW and a lot of Simple radios that they use are only CW radios. That doesn't mean it's only uh, CW, but a lot of people do operate CW on QRP. It's becoming more and more popular with young people. They think it's a secret code. Yeah, I find when I'm doing a presentation for a school group, I get yawns when I show them single sideband. But if I'm showing, if I'm demonstrating code or FT8, they're much more excited. I had an interesting thing. I was helping one of my friends proctor an exam and they took away all of the kids' phones and they took away any papers that they had. And I'm sitting up in front with the teachers and I'm hearing Morse code. 
they were tapping to each other with their pencils. And they were answering back the answers with their pencils doing Morse code. And I was up there copying it. They thought they had the teachers know because the teachers didn't know Morse code. <laughs> and of course, once I showed this to the main teacher, he stopped the exam and invalidated everybody's questions. And they had no idea why. <laughs> well, but it's I true. Want, All the I, people do not know Morse code. Yeah, I want to mention the people because I see we have a number of people here that are maybe new to Rad Pack. We do this every week. Typically, we do general information on Wednesdays and MCOM on Thursdays. This week is the reverse week. Uh, we switched around because of scheduling issues, but uh, please feel free to join us. Go to the radpack.us website and sign up for any of the mailing list. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on uh, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. Other questions, I'd be happy to try and answer questions or if you have experiences you wanna share with the group. Uh, Doug shares the fact that there's a new book on Amazon called The CW Way of Life, Learning, Living and Loving Morris Code. Uh, you can take a look at that if you're interested. Questions, comments? Okay, I'll bring up another comment. Yes. Uh, I will, years ago, I was getting into more and more power as I got a, a higher class license. Oh boy, I got to celebrate, I got to get more power. And uh, my, I had saved some money for uh, the greatest radio, whatever it might be. And I had a nice little chunk. And my wife came in and says, your daughter needs a sewing machine. <laughs> You're with my money. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I was without, a, I had sold my low band radio, the last one, to, to replace it. And uh, so anyhow, a friend of mine had a hot water aid. Everybody remembers those things. So a little three watt heath kit radio. And he says, you can't talk to anybody with it. It's so little power, but you can at least receive. So, okay. And he sold it to me. And I heard a guy there. He's a I was living in Utah at the time. I heard a guy up in Oregon that was a good friend of mine. He was on CW. And so I just plugged my key into it, gave him a call. Well, I got to lose. He came right back to me, gave me a good report. And I, wow. And I said, well, let me see what else this will do. That thing got to be more fun. I don't know why I ever got away from QRP, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, and I found that uh, during contests, people will pull, try, try to pull you out, especially on field day. You can find more people pulling you out of the mud when you're on QRP than on, on a normal day when they're looking for loud signals. Enough of my chat. Back to you there, Anthony. Well, hey, I wouldn't know anything about QRP. I've only done 109,000 cues on QRP, Dan, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do that yeah. talk about that. There was a question in the chat about uh, they went to my KZT dash p and they said which of this which i had three presentations there the slideshow is the same for, for them except for i do have a little bit shorter shot slideshow but you want the long slideshow because you want to get all the resources and i am always updating it so even though these say the same thing that it's the it'll be the most recent one i'll fix those links that were busted and there's a couple times i've presented this for video but tonight's video will be the newest one so uh you you know you might want to use that one Okay. Okay. There you have a. I have a question. Okay, Steve, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, Anthony, Steve here, W3AZT in Philadelphia. Um, question. So I've been intrigued with CW for at least ten years now, and it's always the fact of the matter that I start, and then I walk away from it, and then I'll come back to it. But I really want to. I really want to get in there and try it and do it. Um, now, I have a uh, what I call a butterfly CW paddle key, right? Or a twin ear, how did you say it? I forget. But would you recommend that, that I keep with that, or should I go to a straight key? Well, let me give you a couple of suggestions on that. The number one thing is I think that's why having a buddy or a group working with it is a good way to go because that keeps you moving forward. I can strongly re recommend both of the groups, the CW Ops group or the Long Island CW group. If you're a person that tends to procrastinate, I would suggest the CW Ops group because there's a schedule that you have to be there at the same time each each session. Mm -hmm. So it helps in that respect. And you're also working with the same group, cohort of people. With the Long Island CW group, it's a little more flexible in that you can attend any of the sessions 
and they use something called the carousel method. So each week, all the, all the beginner sessions are teaching the same three characters that week. So you could stop in any day or any time at, that there's a beginner's class and you'll be getting the same characters that week. And they just keep rotating through three character sets every week. So that's that could be helpful. As far as the key goes, there is there are people that will tell you, you must start with a stray key. And there are other people that say you must start with a keyer. Even amongst these two groups, there's some, some discussion. I think that you're fine with either one you feel comfortable with. And uh, that's that. I wouldn't worry so much about that. Yeah, because I, I always go back to my brother is a musician, and he learned uh, how to play the guitar in grade school. And um, sister always told him, drop that electric guitar. You got to learn on the acoustic. And I'm thinking Morse code is sort of the same thing, you know. You don't have to go. You don't have to use a straight key. There's some people that think that it's better to learn that way, but there's other people that that really like the paddles better, and they learn that way. Both yeah. of, in both of them, you're trying to develop muscle memory, so you you want to sort of feel the way the coat is also. But right. you can do the same muscle memory thing with the key and with the CW key. So I don't right. think that there's one right or wrong way to do that. Uh -huh. And I would suggest you stay away from a bug as the learning tool because it involves another whole set of of operations. So when I'm talking about uh, a keyer, I'm talking about paddles, either a single paddle as a side swiper or dual paddles or uh, a stray key. But I would, I'm not a fan of learning on a bug. Oh, I don't right. think that's the, the easiest way to learn. And you already got part of it down because you got a great last two letters in your call sign there, Steve. Yeah, I know. That's what everybody tells me. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a question in chat I want to answer. There were two questions in chat I want to answer. Um, some some recommend newcomers delay using a key until they can copy all the characters. No, I don't agree on that. I there's no there's nothing that says that that is a better way to go. Uh, again, you're building you're building two tools. You're building that sending tool and the receiving tool. There's nothing wrong with learning them both at the same time. Um, there's a question, can you explain FT8? Uh, yes, go to my presentation from a couple of weeks ago on Beginners FT8 on the Rat Pack site. There's a whole one hour session. FT8 is a digital sound card mode. Uh, FT4 is very similar and I don't wanna be flippant, but that it's a whole night's program uh, to explain that. So that's the way to go. And Ringo has the link to the Long Island CW group in there and um, I'm not sure what the lesson three means. Okay. Any other questions out there? Wait, no hands? No. I saw someone. Who was it? Someone started to talk. Okay. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. I thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this is K4BLB. Uh, much appreciated. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, Bob in Denver said, "Thanks, Anthony. See you Saturday. I'll be, I'll be at the uh, Longmont Hamfest on Saturday uh, via Zoom. I won't be there in person. So Longmont, Colorado Hamfest on Saturday." and uh, the Bergen Amateur Radio Club in New Jersey on Sunday. And if you'd like a program for your local club, again, uh, tiny.cc slash k8zt dash p gets you a link to all my presentations, and I'd be happy to do one for your local group. Well, I am I also comment at this point that Rat Pack has uh, 200 and some odd pre-recorded, ready to go uh, uh, presentations there so uh, you can download it and give it and sit and present it to your club and uh, just like this one will be available it's all free so have that folks there's no reason you can't have uh, some kind of a presentation at your clubs or amateur events and you definitely have to ask some questions because dan will be disappointed if i don't go past the hour here <laughs> he's expecting me to do that I'm going to get done on time tonight, Dan, and then you're not going to be able to tell me I was long-winded. Yeah, well, we had a um, yesterday turnout right on time, too. A couple of unusual ones there. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. Barry, how's chat doing? 
We're great. Everybody's thanking Anthony. Okay. Oh, you're very welcome.